For those of you who have just joined and weren't at the previous presentation, welcome and thank you for joining us at the Australian Super 2022 Annual Member Meeting, our question and answer session. My name is Rose Curlin and I'm the Group Executive Membership and Brand. So let's get started. Just to reiterate, to ask a question, please click on the question box on the bottom of your screen that says Q&A and type in the question field that says, enter your question and then press submit. As a reminder, please don't put any personal information into the question box. If you do happen to have a question of a personal nature, please contact us via our website, the Australian Super app, or by calling the contact centre. To answer your questions, we have a number of subject matter experts available in the studio and via video conference. We have a quorum of Australian Super Directors joining us, including some of those you heard from in the presentations, Dr Don Russell and Philippa Kelly. We also have with us the Chief Executive, Paul Schroeder, the Chief Investment Officer and Deputy Chief Executive, Mark Delaney, our Fund Actuary and Fund Auditor, PwC, represented by Craig Cummins. For questions that we cannot answer now, an answer will be provided in the minutes to the meeting, which will be available on the Australian Super website from the 29th of December. Without further ado, let's go to your questions. We've already had some coming through, so I'll go to the first one now. We've had a few members ask about the fund's approach to supporting the transition to a low carbon economy, and in particular, how do we hold companies to account for their climate action plans? I'm going to invite Andrew Gray, Australian Super's Head of ESG and Stewardship, to give us an overview of what we're doing, and then Philippa to provide a perspective from the Investment Committee. And uh, thanks very much to the members that have asked the question. It really is an important question um, because uh, the way we approach the low carbon transition is really important as to how we'll manage investment risk for members. And clearly certain companies are obviously exposed, such as fossil fuel companies and potential stranded asset risks. But there's also investment risks and opportunities throughout the economy, through most companies as they develop business strategies uh, for a low carbon world. So I'm going to talk about three key actions that we take to hold companies to account in terms of their climate transition plans. So the three key actions that we undertake are we measure, we engage and we vote. So just talking through each of those in turn, in terms of measurement, so Mark mentioned earlier the uh, quite deep carbon footprinting we're doing on the portfolio. And as an example, if we look at our internal Australian equities portfolio, we know that the current carbon footprint of that portfolio is 83 tonnes of CO2 per million dollars invested. We also know, though, that if we uh, take into account the promises that companies are making in terms of their own net zero commitments, that number comes down to 12.4 tonnes of CO2 per million dollars invested at 2050. So we can see a clear pathway in the portfolio towards net zero if the companies uh, that make those promises deliver on those promises. So the first point here is we need to measure that so we know the potential sources of where that reduction in the carbon is going to come from. Then the second step that we undertake is given that, given the identification of we know which companies are going to deliver uh, to get the portfolio to net zero, we need to engage with the companies on those deliveries. So the last few years have very much been about seeking that companies make those net zero commitments as companies have increasingly done that, our future focus is making sure we've got delivery of those promises. So it's things, things such as making sure companies have milestones. Um, it's things such as making sure companies are looking at what their blockages are if they're uh, hard to abate sectors um, and working sort of collaboratively around the economy um, in terms of uh, solving those blockages. Um, in terms of our engagement program, um, in financial year 2022, we had 75 engagement meetings uh, with 41 ASX 300 companies. Obviously not all those were climate change related engagements, but where companies are heavily exposed or have made net zero commitments, that would be a key part of the engagement with those companies. Uh, globally, um, we're a founding uh, 
investor of what's called Climate Action 100, which is the way we can engage globally with companies on their climate transition plans. Um, and then finally, I mentioned the sort of third key activity that we undertake in holding companies to account is to vote. So voting is a really important mechanism for us where we can have our say uh, formally in terms of how we think companies are responding to climate change management and whether they're delivering on their, on their climate transition plans. So there's a couple of key types of votes that we undertake. Uh, the first one is on what we call say on climate. So companies globally and many companies in Australia have undertaken to develop climate transition plans and put those to shareholder votes. So we actively consider those and vote in favour or against, depending on whether we think the plan adequately enunciates the transition to net zero and how the company is going to deliver value uh, as, the, as the economy transitions to net zero. So we have in fact voted against a climate transition plan where we thought the company hadn't put forward a sufficient plan. Um, and then the final or the second type of vote in terms of holding companies to account on climate uh, transition is shareholder resolutions. So in the last few years we've increasingly seen uh, uh, shareholder resolutions where uh, various uh, shareholders are putting forward uh, resolutions asking companies to take certain actions on climate change. So again we assess those very actively uh, and look through the lens of uh, does the resolution uh, help to enhance the long-term value of the company and therefore whether we should support the resolution. So again, there have been a number of resolutions that we've supported over the years where we thought that in fact has been achieved and we thought it was uh, good to support the resolution from a climate transition perspective. So they're the sort of three, the key actions that we undertake. Um, and what I'll hand over now to is to Philippa, who's gonna talk a bit more about the international context. Thank you, Andrew. I'd like to add a comment uh, about the international perspective and how the fund's involved. The fund was a founder member of the group, uh, an investor-led group, Climate Action 100, some five years ago. And pleasingly, we can say, see that Andrew is actually the current chair of that group for, for the next little while. Since founding Climate Action 100, the investor participants have grown to now more than 700 investors and they work with companies globally to lower emissions and strengthen climate related financial disclosures. So we see this as a very active and another meaningful way for the fund to drive change in, dri in achieving the pathway to net zero emissions by 2050. Thank you. Thanks, Australian Super has recently upgraded its member portal and app and we've had a few questions from members about some issues that have been experienced. Sean Blackmore, Australian Super's Group Executive Member Experience, will now provide some information on what we changed and why, as well as how we've been managing the issues that have come up since the upgrade. Thanks, Sean. Hello, everyone. A couple of years ago, we embarked on a project to rebuild the fund's digital assets. That was the portal, the member portal, and the mobile app. And this build was across both the front end, so the interfaces you interact with, the middle layer, the systems and data that integrates to display and allows you to use the app and member portal, and also the back end, the environments in which host and house the software and hardware that we have. And one of the parts of this project was to move that over to the cloud. And we did this for a few reasons. One, modernization, the appearance was dated, starting to get clunky and a bit too uh, much information available. And we're getting a lot of feedback from members about the usability, but also the accessibility. The app wasn't good for visually impaired members or for a lot of members on different size devices. We did it also for scalability. When we first launched the member portal 10 years ago, we had a couple of million transactions on it. The last year we've had over 35 million transactions and we need to make sure that we're ready for the future where that 35 should double in the next two to three years. We did it for availability, making sure that the apps are available for members to use and we'll start to see a degradation in services where more and more time the apps and the portal weren't available for members to use and it was taking us longer to get it back up. And finally we did it for security. It allowed us to incorporate heightened security measures for today's world. 
So the app and portal were launched just over two weeks ago. And for most part, members have been able to transact and use them. But whilst we had the best of plans and thorough testing, a few issues emerged since launch. Firstly, login. There was a group of members who experienced login issues uh, have been able to access accounts. And I acknowledge the frustration that would cause. Whilst that's resolved now, that has caused members uh, who experienced that to call the call centre just to make sure everything was all right. Availability. There's been four or five unplanned outages, and that's where the app and the portal haven't been able to display the information that you wanted to when you went to use them. Now, that generally occurred between 7 and 8 in the morning, and whilst that's been resolved, uh, that has been inconvenience for any members who are trying to use those assets during that time. And then we've got some features. When we launch the features, they are available, but unfortunately, we've had to take them off to do some fixes for them. Those features included to make a withdrawal online. Now, we've had to put a PDF form in there, which isn't a great user experience. That feature will be put on shortly, but in the interim, members haven't been able to do that how they previously would have. Adjusting pension payments was also another feature that didn't quite work as expected, and we've had to replace that with a pension PDF form. Now, that will be available in the next week, but uh, again, we apologise for the inconvenience. Downloading a pension schedule or a Centrelink schedule was off for about a week uh, and required us to fix it. And also for member direct members, there's a couple of issues in accessing that through both the portal and the app for about a week. Now we've addressed the portal and the fix for the app should be coming in the foreseeable future. Now, what I'd like to do is behalf of the fund, apologize for any members that were inconvenienced by this. We didn't set out to have these issues, but we've had a good team available 24 seven that when they've been identified to be able to work and respond to monitor and address the fixes where required. And we'll continue to do that throughout the foreseeable future. Really important that this major upgrade is going to assist members for many years to come and allow us to deliver a, a series of features and functions that wouldn't have been able to be delivered on the old technology. Thank you, Rose. Thanks, Sean. We've had a few questions coming through now about the economic outlook for Mark Delaney. Raja Lingham asks, what is the long-term forecast of the Australian and world economy? And a related question from Maxwell is, do you think the poor economic conditions will quickly recover when the war in Ukraine ends? Over to you, Mark. Yeah, thank you very much for your questions. And um, it's a great opportunity to answer them. The global economy had a very deep recession during the financial crisis. It's a long time to think back to that, but it was a terrifying time, really. And since 2009, right up to 2022, the global economy performed and the Australian economy performed very strongly. COVID was an interruption, but really the long term trend was a pickup in economic act act activity and big declines in the unemployment rate. We're now at the point whereby inflation's rising. Unemployment is, is very low and wages are rising and we're getting toward the end of that economic cycle. It's inevitable we're going to have some sort of downturn globally and Australia may be also affected but not as severely. Looking beyond that, uh, you can see a recovery taking place and we're starting to think about that for the portfolio. What would, how would we set a portfolio for an eventual recovery? And so we don't think we, we don't think the underlying picture for the world has changed that much over this whole period. You have recessions every decade, pretty much on the clockwork of 10 years or so. And we're also having periods whereby the economies perform quite strongly. So I think this is going to be fine in the longer term, albeit with growth maybe being slightly lower than what we've seen historically. Oh, the Ukraine question. Sorry about that. Um, I don't think the Ukraine's going to have a big impact upon the economic outlook. Um, it's had an impact on commodity prices, but it's, outside of that, it's been quite um, localised. And so unless the conflict globalised, I don't think it's going to have a big impact upon markets. Thanks, Mark. Related to the economic outlook, our member William has asked, what is management's strategies to deal with global economic uncertainties and minimise investment risks? 
What are you going to do to protect us with a looming recession? I might ask Philippa to provide her view and then Mark for additional comments. Thank you, Rose. Um, and this goes to the heart of what I was talking about earlier. Critically, it's having the right strategy to provide the optimal long-term returns as well as the resilience to withstand market cycles. So for us, the key elements of internally managing the portfolio, operating as a global fund, and increasing our investments in private markets. The way we've responded to the current volatility we're seeing in the economy and investment markets has been to position the portfolio more defensively, altering asset allocation and principally reducing our listed equity exposure. But I I'll, I'll, might turn to Mark for some more detail on, on the specifics. Yeah, I think, thanks Philip. I think there's been two phases to how the markets have performed. The first phase has been the market being affected by the rise in interest rates. And you saw that affect bond markets in particular, where fixed interest had a negative year last year, quite unusual. And you also see it in uh, highly expensive equity stocks, which have come down a fair bit in value. So higher interest rates is the first phase of this bear market. That's flowed through to uh, those style investments. What we've sought to do is to have a small exposure to fixed income and to de-weight our exposure to those growthy style stocks. Looking out a little bit further, as the economy slows, it, there's a fair chance that the market's going to become concerned about declines in earnings as companies find it harder to make profits. We think that's going to affect other stocks in the market and probably cause a little bit more weakness. And as I said earlier, looking beyond that, there's a fair chance that as the market stabilises, we'll be able to buy stocks at pretty attractive valuations with really good medium term prospects. So in some ways, falling share prices provides an opportunity for us to refresh the portfolio by better companies with better long-term prospects. Thanks, Mark. We have a question now from Geoffrey, which I'll give to Mike Backerberg, our Chief Technology Officer. Mike, can you tell us what is being done to ensure the cyber security of Australian super accounts, including our personal information? moment to just reflect on what has happened recently in the market and going on with the incidents that have been widely reported in the media obviously raises a concern for members as it does for the fund. If I go back to 2018, the improvement in cyber security was a decision made by the board, supported by the executive. And this is very important because improving cyber security and the, the safety of data is a long-term program. So we've been actively working on it for many years, but increased our internal capability with a dedicated information security team who are focused on ensuring that we operate an environment that is safe and secure for members and colleagues to actually work on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, included in that is a look in our, at our core suppliers who bring services to the fund, and we do regular assessment of what those cybersecurity controls are and how they operate. More specifically, in relation to what's happened recently, we've increased the number of controls to ensure that we validate any behavior on a member's account where we have concerns that something may be happening. And that gives us an opportunity to retest and validate that the transaction is in fact valid. I would also like to touch on the fact that um, cybersecurity remains a focus for every colleague in the fund not only in our technology colleagues, but every single person who works across the fund. With that, we have regu regular cybersecurity awareness sessions. Most recently, we had an awareness day with 260 colleagues across the fund participating, understanding what we can do to improve awareness and really bring better outcomes to every member. For you participating in the session, we have detailed information on our public website if you feel that there is something malicious or fraudulent happening, I encourage you to look at our website, go, go to the links that are available. There is support that you can access, reach out to our contact centre and take steps to really protect your information. We will obviously continue to monitor this and really look to bring the best controls and environment that we have available to you. And the last point I just want to touch on is that this question is crucially important to what we need to do as an industry, what we need to do as a community, recognising that cyber criminals are not working in our best interests. 
being aware and raising these questions really helps us go forward and, and take positive proactive steps to ensure that all member data is secure and that we can look after what we need to do to bring you the best services that we possibly can in achieving members' best financial outcomes. Thank you, Rose. Great, Mike. Really important information there for all of us. This next question I'll give to Paul Schroeder, and it comes from Hal. Hal has asked, how does the admin cost charged to members compare with other funds? Thanks, Hal. Look, just before I answer that question, um, could I just say on behalf of all of us here, um, what a privilege it is to be here today. I, it's a really important uh, evening for us to be able to answer your questions. Um, and can I thank each of you for being here tonight. Um, to Howe's specific question, um, admin fees are really important to keep down and that's one of the reasons we, tr we try to build the fund. So you've got more members having to pay less. But admin fees are only part of the story and I'll come to that in a moment. The most important thing is net benefit. How much money do you have at the end from your earnings, less your investment fees, less your admin fees. But to answer the specific question, uh, Australian Super's admin fees, uh, according to the Chant West survey, uh, for somebody with a $50,000 balance, uh, we're sixth cheapest out of 60. Uh, for somebody with a $500,000 balance, we're the seventh cheapest out of 60. And for somebody with a choice income account with $250,000 in it, uh, we're the fifth cheapest out of 82. So in all of those cases, uh, we're right up the, the cheapest end. But of course, we want to do the very best for you. So we need to be able to provide the services, including the cyber security and the protections that, that you need um, from us. So yes, we are using size and scale to keep admin fees low. And hopefully that's been indicated uh, by me explaining where we are in the rankings. But I'd, I'd just urge members who are online just to think about the main thing is net benefit. So admin fees plus investment fees in the context of your overall overall earnings and, and over time, uh, we're, that's all we focus on, which is how to make sure you have more money in your account. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Stephen has asked a question about the board. So I'll give this to our chair, Dr. Don Russell. Don, can you tell us what is the board doing to embed governance standards that reflect those of other large organisations in Australia? Well, thanks, thanks Rose and, and Stephen. Uh, important question. Uh, it, it is a topic that the board is always very conscious of because uh, we have to um, be certain that we have uh, you know, the best arrangements on the board and that the directors have uh, the right skills and backgrounds to, uh, to do justice to our responsibilities. And that is very much around uh, the strategic direction of the fund, the broad policy uh, outline uh, for a whole range of areas. Uh, we've also got to have um, you know, the capability uh, and the background to be able to uh, ask the right questions of, of, of management, um, to hold management uh, to account. But uh, we are also very conscious that one of our really important uh, responsibilities is to, uh, to safeguard the, the member first culture, to make sure that the members are centre stage of everything we do and that, um, that the fund doesn't uh, uh, over time allow the member first culture to erode into something more akin to uh, fund first. And so uh, we've put in recent years a lot of attention on, um, on identifying the skills that the, uh, the board needs, that directors need, uh, the skills that we need to make sure that we have the right people uh, capable of doing justice to all our, um, our working committees. So we have um, developed skill metrics, which um, is, is publicly available. Uh, we've invested in board reviews uh, and uh, we have um, an independent chair of the board itself and we have an independent chair of the um, investment committee. And we're also very conscious that uh, as we engage, as Australian Super engages with, uh, with corporates, Australian corporates and corporates around the world, we ourselves uh, have to have uh, cutting edge best in class uh, in governments uh, for our own arrangements if we expect to engage with other, com uh, other companies and expect them uh, to take us seriously when we talk to them about their governance. So um, yes, 
Thanks, Stephen. And uh, it's something that uh, we, we constantly keep an eye on. This next question has come in from Patrick and I'm going to allocate it to Alastair Barker. Alastair is our Head of Total Portfolio Management in the investment team. Patrick asks, why is the conservative balanced option producing a worse result in these unstable times than the balanced option? It is supposed to be less exposed to stock market fluctuations than the balanced option and yet it has been consistently poorer despite savings interest rates rising. Thanks, Patrick. Great question, and I suspect that you're not alone. A number of questions have come through from members asking a similar question about our diversified fixed interest option, as well as a number of other options. Um, so I'll offer two responses. The first is, why is this occurring? And the second is, what do we think might happen in the future? So on the first, why is this happening? Well, it is irregular. Um, as Philippa and Mark mentioned earlier, it's because the issue that's been ailing share markets is also ailing fixed interest markets. So because the conservative balanced option, as well as options like diversified fixed interest are in fixed income markets, rising interest rates have impacted both. Um, that's quite irregular. It doesn't happen all the time, but it does happen out every now and then. And that's happening because of high inflation. You know, we've got the Reserve Bank, uh, the US central bank and other central banks around the world trying to raise rates to address high inflation. So that's what's causing it. What do we think might happen going forward and will this occur again? Well, we would say it's less likely to occur going forward. And the main reason for that is that the rise in interest rates is largely in the price of financial markets as we speak. So if you were to go and fix your mortgage rate or if you were to go and get a term deposit, if you were to do that for, say, the next two to four years, you'd be looking at an interest rate of around 4%, something like that. So the rise in interest rates is largely in the price of financial markets. And what you will see that come through in fixed interest and cash investments over the coming years. So one of the reasons why returns on our cash option uh, are lower than what you can get a term deposit is because that term deposit reflects the future investment return you could get from interest rates over the next few years versus our cash option is what you would have earned in cash over the previous few years, which have been very, very low as interest rates have been low. So we don't expect it to occur as often, but it does happen from time to time, and it's typically an environment like the one we're seeing where you have high inflation. But thank you for your question. Thanks, Alastair. Paul, I'll ask you to take this next question. It's from Jatinda, and Jatinda asks, I have invested 90% of my super in international shares. May I know in which shares you have invested my super in? Great, thanks Jatinda. Uh, yes, there's a really great way for you to know precisely where you're invested and all members uh, involved in this meeting uh, tonight. Um, of course, it's your money, you should know everything about it. It's, it's Australian, it's super and it's yours, it's your money. So if you um, go to the website, um, think about there's a little spot there about investments and then how we invest. So if you get on there, you can get to how we invest. So investments and then how, how we invest. And you'll be able to see precisely uh, what the funds invested in on your behalf uh, by assets, by volume, by proportion. And in the case of property, um, usually there's a Google map there so you can see the location of, of the properties um, that you own uh, as well. We update that in December and in June. Um, all funds have to do something like that now, but we've been doing it since 2016. So primarily because it's your money. You're, you're investing it, you should know exactly where it is. And on the website, investments and then how we invest, you can see it at all manner of cuts and different angles and you'll be able to see exactly what you own there, Jatinda. Thanks. Great, uh, The next question is from Tony and it's for Mark Delaney. So Mark, what do you see performance will look like in the next 10 years? Thanks, Tony, that's a pretty good question. Um, I'll give you my best guess as an answer. The last 10 years, the balance plan earned over 9% per annum, which is a really big return for us. In the long run, we set out to earn inflation, which is say two, two and a half percent, plus an extra 4%, so six and a half percent is our long run number. Now, if we can do better than that, we're adding values of members, and the last period has been very 
good for members and we made 9%. I don't think the next 10 years is going to be as good as the last 10 years. Uh, and that's because interest rates aren't going to be as low and as favourable as what we saw during that period after the financial crisis. So I'm inclined to think that returns will come back more toward the long run average of six and a half to seven and a half, those style numbers, rather than the very big returns of 9% we saw in the past 10 years. Thanks, Mark. A couple of questions have come in from members about risk investing in China. So I'm going to allocate these to fill up. John has asked if there are risks investing in China and Ian has asked if we should have an office in Beijing given the current political climate with China. Philippa. Thank you, Rose, and Ian and John for your questions. Uh, interestingly, our Beijing office is uh, slightly different from New York and London, where they are completely focused on the investment activities of the, the regions in which they're located. Our Beijing office really recognises the importance of China as a, a global economy and also a driver of future growth but we have very limited investment exposure through that office. And really the focus is on more macroeconomic conditions. Uh, and we have a very small team, but they're well supported. Thanks. Our next question is from Kevin, and I'll give this to Paul. Did Australian Super make any payments or donations to any political party or union during the year ended June 30, 2022? If so, to which party and or union and how much? Uh, thanks, Kevin. Uh, first of all, let me uh, say very clearly that we don't make any donations or any political donations or anything of the sort. Um, super is a multi-generational thing and it's really important for Australian Super to be non-party political and to not get involved in one or other point of politics. Because if you think about the members of the fund, across this whole night, many of you will hold a range of political views and those political views could change over time. So we're very, very committed to being multi-partisan and all of parliament because if you're a 25 year old in this fund, you probably have 10 or 15 different federal treasurers in your life and we need to work closely and well connected with them. So we don't make political contributions. We don't get involved in party politics and we certainly um, don't make donations. There are, there are a couple of things that we do where we do make payments though, because of course uh, we need to pay directors and they come from organisations. Uh, and also uh, we have a range of uh, commercial commitments that we have through contractual arrangements at commercial rates with unions and employer associations who help us in encouraging members to join the fund or to stay with the fund or indeed to provide guidance and help and advice to, to members about what they should do um, with their, their accounts to build, to build their balances. So no, we don't make political or charitable contributions. We don't get involved in party politics, but we do make payments uh, to unions and to um, employer associations for the purposes of encouraging members to join, staying in the fund or uh, helping them uh, make uh, uh, good decisions about their, about their balances. And, those related party payments are in the financial accounts. Of course, everything we spend needs to be shared with APA and the regulator, um, but you can find most of that material uh, at the specific level uh, in the financial accounts. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. We've got another question for Mark, and this one's from John. John asks, unlisted assets are, I understand, valued internally. Is this correct? And if so, how do you ensure the correct value? Yeah, thanks, John. The, um Unlisted valuation question gets a lot of publicity, particularly around this time when there's been a downturn to the share market. So it's worthwhile just giving a bit of background on how we value unlisted, how unlisted assets are valued and the whole context of that. Unlisted assets are different from listed assets. They're not valued by the share market day to day, they're valued at a whole enterprise value within valuation terms a willing buyer and a willing seller. So just as you get your house valued by a professional valuer, we get our unlisted assets also valued by professional valuers. That's, either, that's done either by, through the managers instructing the valuers to undertake that themselves, and in some circumstances, Australian Super will instruct the valuers to get independent valuations done. So good valuation practice is one which is timely, is independent, and uses all the information av available. These core principles 
timely, independent and using the inf all the information available. And what we use when we do our valuations, so no, we don't do our own valuations, we don't think that's appropriate and they are independently determined. Thanks, Mark. Our next question is from Oscar and I'm going to give this to Anthony Smolik, our Education Manager. Oscar would like to know, do we have a financial advisor we can talk to about super changes? Thank you, Rose. Uh, there are a couple of ways you can get advice through Australian Super. So if you're looking for simple, uh, simple super advice, you can uh, get some over the phone advice with our qualified financial advisors around things like contributions, investments, insurance. If you're looking at things like transition to retirement and retirement uh, income products, then there may be a small cost involved, but otherwise, usually there is no additional cost for simple super advice. If you're looking for more comprehensive financial advice, then again, through the helpline or through the website, you can ask to either meet in person with one of our financial planners at Australian Super or via a uh, internet uh, link up and go through a more detailed and robust financial strategy. If you find yourself unable to come into one of our uh, head offices or uh, unwilling to do a Zoom meeting or MS Teams meeting, then you can use the Find Advisor tool on our website and find a financial planner in your local area that is on our list of registered financial planners across Australia, and you may be more comfortable that way. But thank you for your question. Thanks, Anthony. The next question is for Mark. This comes from Joachim, who would like to know the investment fees increased substantially last year. Do you forecast similar increases this year? It seems the growing size of the fund is not producing economies of scale. Is it a fair assessment? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, it's something we're really sensitive to, economies of scale. What we're trying to do at Australian Super is, through our scale, deliver better member outcomes. And part of that is through lower fees, and Paul talked about where our fees were. So last year, um, our investment fees went up by about 10 basis points because we paid a lot more stamp duty on a number of unlisted assets, which were land rich in New South Wales in particular. Now, when we buy a large property asset or large infrastructure asset, uh, we invariably have to pay stamp duty and that gets incorporated into the investment fees. This year, we don't think we're gonna be buying as many assets as last year, so I don't think those fees are gonna be repeated. But in the longer term, if we're acquiring high quality assets which have a large land component, we'll have to pay the stamp duty and that's just part and parcel of investing your money well. Thanks, Mark. We're going to stay with you. We've got another question for you. This one from Megana. She'd like to know, how does the long-term investment mindset help those who are close to retirement? Yeah, investing is a long-term game. You're exactly right. Um, the, long, the more you look at the longer run, the less you worry about the short run. And if you worry less about the short run, you don't worry about market volatility and make uh, mistakes when markets have fallen. So when you're close to retirement, it is a stressful period because you're not sure how you're gonna go in retirement, how your savings are gonna hold up. The key thing to note is that market volatility will occur during your accumulation phase and in your retirement phase. But those periods of market volatility pass and in the long run, your assets continue to grow. So during retirement, you still have the chance to grow your assets quite substantially. Um, and that will be the best strategy if you can possibly afford it. Um, so I wouldn't worry about it too much. I just think that's part and parcel of what things are going to happen. But in the long run, if you focus on how things are going to be in five and 10 years time, these shorter term events just generally tend to work themselves out. Thanks, Mark. This next question has come in from Giuseppe and I'll give this one to Alastair. Giuseppe asks, the current fund policy puts all new members in the balanced option, regardless of their personal circumstances. Should this be reconsidered? Other funds act differently. Great question, Gi Giuseppe. Um, in terms of how we think about it, we, we do have regard to different cohorts of members. And specifically in retirement, the government has recently released uh, some legislation called the Retirement Income Covenant. And this refers to the requirement for all funds to have regards to specific cohorts of their members in terms of what products they go into. So I think one really important point about this is that particularly for people coming into retirement, and Mark mentioned this earlier, we have to look at things holistically. And, and what do I mean by that? Well, 
in the case of people coming into retirement, the majority of our members have uh, a government age pension. And for many of our members, it's actually the largest part of their investment income. So you might draw some income from your Australian super pension account, but the biggest part of your income is often from the pension. So in thinking about your overall risk, quite a lot of your risk is actually in a government guaranteed, inflation protected annuity. So quite a secure income. So when we think about uh, people's overall risk, we consider not just their Australian super pension, but how it interacts with the government pension. So thank you for your question. Thanks, Alastair. This next question is from Michelle, and I'll give this to Don. Are future mergers with other funds planned, and what advantages are there for members? Uh, thanks, Rose, and uh, thanks for the question, Michelle. Uh, mergers have been uh, an important part of the uh, Australian super growth story, and uh, it's probably fair to say that over the years we've uh, developed uh, quite a capability to uh, bring uh, new members into the fund and we're particularly pleased that over the last year we've been able to welcome, successfully welcome, um, Lucrif members and uh, Club Plus members. And uh, we are conscious that uh, in, in this time of uh, consolidation when a lot of funds are, uh, are actually looking for other partners, um, that we do have responsibilities to look at mergers uh, on their merits. And uh, the board has thought about this uh, at some length and uh, the board is very clear that we are not interested in growth for growth's sake, um, that we do have the scale, that we don't have to chase scale as an objective in its own right, uh, and that uh, we can view uh, possible mergers uh, on their merits and to be sure that when we do them, they are really in the best interests of uh, of our members and uh, that will be um, how we uh, continue to approach um, this issue as, uh, as we go forward. Thanks Don. The next question is from Warren and I'll give this one to Paul. Is Australian superintending to invest members' money in the federal government's proposed public housing scheme? If so, how will members' investments be protected? Is there a guaranteed return? And if not, will members be able to opt out of having their money invested in this scheme? Thanks, uh, Warren. Uh, there's quite a few parts to that question. I'll try and address all of them. Uh, the first part is, uh, are we intending to invest mo members' money? Well, the answer is we don't know yet uh, because it'll always be, always be a matter of risk and return. And will we be getting a good enough return for the risks that we're taking? So what we have said is we're really absolutely committed to engaging in a discussion with the construction industry and with local government and with state governments and with federal governments to see if we can be an active and positive force in the discussion about housing affordability because a lot of people are having a lot of trouble finding safe and secure um, housing, especially younger people. But our only lens is, will we make enough money for you out of it? And some of you might have seen that I made some public comments saying that the kind of return we need is somewhere between 6% and 11%, depending on how much risk we're taking or the risks that we're sharing with others. So the answer is we've, we, we haven't had to consider whether we are going to invest or not because there's nothing in front of us to make a judgment about. If you ask, are we interested in engaging properly about this? Of course we are because Australian super members are members of the Australian community and they want to be able to live well in retirement and, and as they're building their balances. So the answer is no, we haven't decided to do anything about that yet. And we're working constructively, but we'll only do it if it makes you enough money for the risk that we're taking on your behalf. The second part of that is um, how, how will members' interest be protected? Well, you'll be protected in exactly the same way as we apply the investment thesis to any other thing as part of a diversified portfolio. So. Don't be, in under, don't be in any illusion, we'll only ever see this through an investing lens. But we do think that if the federal government released more land and if it was easier to get approvals and if construction could become cheaper because it could be done at scale and then if we and banks were involved in that, we do think that there's an investable proposition there but it's a long, long way before we'll need to make a judgement about whether we're investing or not. So thanks for the question. Great, Paul. 
We've only got time for one more question, so we'll stay with you. We've had one come through from Yastu Yuki, and she's asked, it seems that the size impacts are positive in terms of its services levels by a reduction of fees through economies of scale. What are the drawbacks from a growing size of fund? If there are, how does Australian Super assess and manage drawbacks from increasing size of the fund, particularly investments? Oh, thanks, Yasuyuki. That's a fantastic, and that's a question that's on the mind of the executive and on the board and all the way through the organisation. Um, so yes, there are definitely advantages of size and scale and bringing together skill. And, and being bigger does allow you to have lower fixed cost per member and it allows you to do more things and it allows you to speak with a stronger voice and it allows you to attract more talented people to, to do the job of helping you have a bigger balance for your retirement. As you get bigger though, you have to do things differently. And you might recall that over the years, we've internalised investments, done more and more of that inside the fund. And that's saved about a billion dollars over the last seven years in investment costs. But you need to keep evolving the model. And for all the members involved tonight, um, we're, we're going more global, we're internalising more, and, and we're looking more at private assets. They're great opportunities for us to make money for you and, and make more money for you than we'll, you wouldn't be able to make for yourself or be able to make in another fund. So we're very conscious though that you couldn't be the same and be successful at bigger scale. As we grow, we need to evolve the model. We've had Bain and company in helping us with that and thinking about our target operating model because we will all, all of you online tonight, we'll all be part of a $1 trillion fund in the foreseeable future. And we need to make the steps and take the actions now to make sure we've got the culture and the talent and the people and the systems and the processes and the methods that are commensurate with a large global fund. So the answer to your question is we're thinking very carefully about that. We know that scale will be to your benefit because size and scale and skill will deliver you benefits, but no benefit comes without cost. And we have to think very carefully about how we'll change and how we'll evolve the model over time. As I say, we've had Bain in, we're thinking about this and we're thinking about it through a 2030 lens and beyond so that when we have this meeting next year and the year after and in 10 years time, you can be really confident about your super and your balance and the people who are serving you to try and make you, put you in the position where you can have the best retirement possible. Thank you, Paul. Now that brings us to the end of our time for our question and answer session. I apologise to anyone whose question wasn't answered, but as I mentioned earlier, we will be putting responses and the minutes of this meeting onto the Australian Super website within one month of the meeting. These minutes will be available at australiansuper.com forward slash AMM. I also wanted to remind our members that all of today's Super Talks were recorded and will also be available for replay on our website. I hope you have found this event informative and that you've got some of your questions answered or that you are able to attend one of the Super Talks and find out more about your fund. I hope that's made you feel more confident about your superannuation and your life in retirement. Thank you so much for joining us. I look forward to welcoming you back to our next annual member meeting. Thank you.